Hi, welcome to the Illinois Basin Carbon Capture and Storage webinar. SES Engineers is proud to present this hour-long webinar and we're glad you joined us today. My name is Stephanie Hill and I assist in leading the carbon capture, sequestration and injection well services team at SES Engineers. So why is carbon capture and storage important? The Earth's natural cycle continually produces and captures carbon, but the volume of greenhouse gases produced by our modern fossil fuel burning industries overwhelms that natural balance. Studies suggest that this imbalance leads to a depletion of our atmosphere, resulting in increased global temperatures and extreme weather patterns. To mitigate this, we need to balance the production and consumption of carbon dioxide emissions. This is called achieving net zero emissions. And globally, we're united to achieve this by 2050. Using injection well technologies that have been around for decades, we can capture emissions before they enter the atmosphere and permanently store or dispose them deep beneath our protected aquifers. The same natural processes that have kept oil and gas trapped in ge geologic formations for millions of years are the same processes that will trap injected carbon dioxide underground so they don't re-enter the atmosphere. CCS is one of the most direct and impactful ways of reducing the greenhouse gases. It's reported to be the short-term solution to reach net zero goals. Because CCS is federally supported, there are numerous attractive tax incentives available to reduce emissions production by implementing CCS projects. The transportation industry is incentivized to use and produce cleaner, low-carbon transportation fuels through the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program. And the aviation industry is incentivized to facilitate innovation, scale up, and to reduce unit cost of sustainable aviation fuel. Although the, these programs are available to a wide array of industries, the lowest hanging fruit for CCS projects is realized by manufacturers with effluent streams rich in carbon dioxide, such as ethanol producers, cement kiln operators, and chemical and fertilizer manufacturers. In this webinar, we'll give you some general information about CCS you can use to determine if this is right in helping you reach your sustainability goals. You'll walk away with an overview of carbon capture and storage, considerations for implementing a carbon capture and storage project, including economic, legal, social, and regulatory considerations, a dissected view of the key components of a project, and finally, a step-by-step -step process for executing a carbon capture and storage project. But first, let's meet a few of our team's experienced scientists and engineers. Dr. Charles Hostetler is a geologist located in central Illinois and specializes in delineation of areas of review and optimizing pore space utilization on CCS projects. He brings extensive experience in subsurface modeling, permitting, and regulatory affairs. Casey Garber is a geologist in central Illinois and focuses on geologic site characterization, delineation of areas of review, and development of testing and monitoring plans for CCS projects. She complements our team with her expertise in environmental consulting and permitting. Candy Elliott is a licensed professional geologist located in North Carolina and specializes in site assessment, statistical and numerical modeling, and geophysical and hydrogeologic investigations on CCS projects. Patty Herman is a biological scientist located in Southern Illinois and has a wealth of knowledge in habitat conservation and restoration. She brings her experience in endangered and threatened species research, landscape restoration, and coal mine permitting and regulation. And finally, Richard Southhorn is both a licensed professional engineer and a professional geologist located in Illinois. He's focused on site selection and community engagement on CCS projects and complements our team with the municipal and industrial waste management design, permitting, and construction oversight. So welcome everyone to the Illinois Basin Carbon Capture and Storage we Webinar. I'll turn it over to Dr. Hostetler. Thank you, Stephanie. So first I'd like to talk about some of the challenges that carbon sequestration faces. Um, it has been, these kinds of projects have been associated by some with enhanced oil recovery. And in fact, that those were some of the first um, carbon capture projects that were implemented in the 1970s. And it's also associated in some um, environmental groups with the Clean Coal Initiative. And so it, these projects can be seen as enabling the fossil fuel industry. 
So these are challenges that Richard will talk about uh, overcoming with your stakeholder group. What I want to focus on today, though, is the practice that um, Stephanie talked about, sequestering relatively pure carbon dioxide from point sources that would otherwise just boil off and emit directly to the atmosphere. So many people, in, including uh, state legislatures, the fellow federal government and some environmental stakeholders feel that this is a necessary step in achieving our greenhouse gas reduction obligations. So what does it look like? Um, we're trying to capture carbon dioxide from a relatively pure source, and that's represented on the left-hand side of the diagram. The left-hand side shows an ethanol plant where carbon dioxide is captured in a facility. And then in this particular case, it's transported by a barge to an injection well where it's injected deep underground. It resides permanently in deep saline pore space beneath a cap rock. Go ahead, please. Okay, so who benefits from this? producers of high content carbon dioxide off gas that would otherwise just be emitted to the atmosphere. Go ahead. All right, so some of the things we're focusing on today, the key project considerations include the co cost of capture. Because things like ethanol plants produce relatively pure carbon dioxide, the cost of capture is relatively cheap and it involves basically just containing it and dehydrating it and compressing it. Then there's the cost of transport because the ethanol plant, the generating facility may not be in the same location as the injection well. And so that has to be reckoned into the accounting. And then finally, there's the cost of storage. Um, this is going to involve injection into deep underground uh, pore space and it, it's at relatively high pressures, and um, the injection pressure buildup underneath has to be monitored throughout the life of the um, of the of the project. Going into more detail on the cost capture, basically the way the accounting standards work for this, your tax credits and your LCFS credits, you get paid by the ton of carbon dioxide sequestered and that's accounted for on a yearly basis. The cost of the capture depends on the composition of the effluent stream. The more CO2 rich effluent stream, the better off you are. Cost of transport. It isn't always possible to have a manufacturing facility located directly above a suitable sequestration site. And the geographic footprint of a sequestration site of an underground well with this pressure buildup can be big compared to the footprint of a manufacturing plant. So there's a couple options that we look at in project scoping. Uh, one is, do we build smaller scale local projects? Um, we can do that in some geologic media, um, maybe not so much in others. Can we develop transport by barge, which is a fairly cheap way to move carbon dioxide around along a navigable waterway like the Illinois River? These are some concepts we're considering. Next, please. Um, cost of sequestration. The upfront costs are big. The permitting is complicated. There's a lot of site characterization, deep wells to drill, and there's construction of, of the deep well and the compressing facility. As I said before, payback is largely by the ton of CO2 sequestered. A typical operational period might be 20 years. And if you're injecting it, say 2 million metric tons, so for a total project size of 40 million metric tons, your income or payback is gonna be stretched out over those that lifetime. And then you have to have um, post-injection care, and that has to be, money for that has to be set aside in a suitable financial instrument. So as you're doing this, you have to have um, financial assurance mechanisms available and documented. Another consideration is that through DOE's carbon safe program, there is federal grant money available for all different phases of funding of these 
kinds of projects. It's allocated on a yearly basis. The next funding opportunity will be in 2024, and that program will run through 2027. There's some other things that we need to look at um, in Illinois in particular. There's some considerations about pore space. Who owns the pore space beneath the facility? And there's um, legislation that's currently passed Illinois State House and Senate that attempts to clarify that. And it's awaiting evaluation for the governor for his signature. There's also some concerns about how liability for environmental damage is allocated. So um, there is also clarifying litigation in the um, Illinois House and Senate that's designed to clarify some of that situation. If, for example, some of the injected gas would move from deep in the pore zone, go ahead, yes, and it would migrate out from beyond the, the land that you owned yourself and either invade somebody else's pore space or possibly migrate vertically upward and um, cause some sort of environmental damage. Next slide. The financial incentives um, we talked about before, the IRS has a program, 45Q tax credits. Uh, those currently are $80 a ton for carbon sequestration for um, relatively pure sources. Uh, there's low carbon fuel standard credits that trade on a marketplace. And if you get into the LCFS program, there's some additional permitting and accounting that you have to do. And as I said, there's some grant funding opportunities that were basically uh, brought in from the bipartisan infrastructure bill of 2020. What does a basic project look like? Um, it might look like an ethanol plant with a capture facility. It might look like a deep injection well that could inject, say, on the order of one and a half to two million metric tons a year. Um, typical injection depth would be on the order of 4,000 to 6,000 feet below the ground surface. The projects get more expensive as they get bigger. Um, and a main thing to concern is as the project gets bigger is that you might have a bigger area of review. In fact, you typically will. And the area of review is the pore space that you're going to impact, uh, either by the plume itself or by pressure. And that means you may have to negotiate with other landowners and stakeholders. You do have financial assurance um, for the post-injection site care. And we know that EPA Region 6, as well as other regions, are particularly sensitive to changing the minimum uh, post-injection site care program from 50 years to some alternate time frame. So you have to be aware of that. And how do spend rates and CapEx flow with time? Um, we'll get into that in a little more detail in the next part of this, but basically these projects are front end loaded in terms of their spend rate and CapEx. And then um, your payback comes over a 20 year period um, as injection proceeds followed by 50 years of lower rate expenses, basically, basically testing and monitoring. And then at the very end, the costs associated with plugging the wells and bringing the site back to its standard condition. Okay, at this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Richard Southorn. Um, he has a lot of experience about social awareness in our partners, uh, your partners, your stakeholders. And he's going to tell us about some of his experiences in that field. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, as Charles said, I'm Richard Southorn. I wanted to speak to you today about the importance of engaging with uh, your stakeholders. Next. So you are going to end up putting a lot of upfront capital and blood, sweat, tears into uh, getting uh, to your permits. Um, and at the end of the day, um, the, the things that will most put you at risk for um, for not getting that permit are things that you may not be aware of. And so engaging with the public is one of the very best ways to learn about the different concerns that, that are around your project so that you can proactively address and meet those concerns through the process uh, to help you be successful. Next. 
So I just want to start off and say stakeholders are not your adversaries. Stakeholders are really anyone who has a vested interest in the pro project. And there's different types of stakeholders. There's politicians and community leaders, but there's also just neighborhoods, environmental groups. They're all going to have different concerns. All of those concerns matter to them. And when when people come together to talk about your project and reach out to you know the the EPA to 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 voice their concerns, um, you want their voice to be aligned with you, not against you. I recommend very early in the project identify who your stakeholders are, reach out to them, and uh, just give them a ten thousand foot view of the project. Explain some of the benefits, why you're doing it, and ask for their feedback. Next. You're going to have to do this if your site is located in an environmental justice area. In Illinois, that means um, any area where uh, low income or minor minority populations are twice the statewide average. But I would recommend employing uh, community engagement really wherever you are located. Next. The good news about carbon capture is that it should be hugely popular. The White House's Council on Environmental Quality has basically given you the roadmap. It is good for the environment and it is good for the economy, which really anyone can get behind. Next. The problem is that people just don't trust companies. They think the companies only care about the bottom line, and they also don't even trust the government to protect them if something were to go wrong. The majority of that lack of trust, the majority of that simply comes from not understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it. Next. So the best way to get rid of that lack of understanding is to meet with people. It's to engage with them regularly over and over and over through the process. You should be explaining to them what you're doing, what you're working on, and why you're doing it. And if people come to you with their concerns, that is your opportunity to incorporate uh, their feedback into improving the project or addressing their concerns through dialogue um, so, so that they don't leave a meeting more scared, more alarmed. That is the goal. Next. So I'm just going to give you a few examples of what I view as successful stakeholder uh, communication. I knew an electric utility um, that had a low level selenium impact to the groundwater at one of their sites. And they didn't, they they viewed it as, as something they, they obviously needed to clean up and they were working on it, but they didn't view it as a, a critical concern. But they learned through speaking with the public that people were very, very nervous about health impacts. Uh, there was a playground nearby. People were concerned that their children were going to be getting sick. They were scared. And so, this electric utility started putting out fact sheets where they talked about what is selenium. They started pointing out that selenium is in every multivitamin and that if you were to just eat one banana, you would you would ingest more selenium than if you drank the groundwater for a year. And they started to control the narrative. They started to meet the public with where they were at and, and help them understand um, the, the relative impact of this. That's successful. It helps um, it helped the public feel better through the cleanup process, and they were able to get rid of the selenium in the groundwater, um, but they kept the public informed through, throughout the process. Another good example is there is a, an Illinois um, landfill company that was trying to permit a brand new landfill. Um, the only problem was is they had to um, destroy a fairly large wetland in order to do so. It wasn't a particularly nice wetland, and they were planning on purchasing some credits at a wetland bank to mitigate the impact. But they they started to learn through talking to, to the public that the public was very, very upset about this uh, impact to the wetland. 
And so they ultimately decided to team with the local park district where they would actually construct a new wetland on park district property where that would have some boardwalks and some bird viewing telescopes and platforms so that the public could enjoy a new wetland. And this was so popular that they actually got letters of support to develop a new landfill, which is about the definition of, an, uh, of a NIMBY project. Um, so that was another huge success. I have a friend who works at the DOT and designs bridges. And he has always tell, told me that he would never ask the public to design a bridge truss, but he is always going to ask the public what color they should they want it painted. Because at the end of the day, people are going to drive over that bridge every day to and from work, and he wants them to feel happy about his project. And that is the spirit that I would like to, to convey to you of how to be successful in your projects. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Patty to get a little bit more in the weeds about carbon capture. Thank you, Richard. My name is Patty Herman, and I would like to provide you an overview of the Class 6 permitting process. As Charles mentioned earlier, spend rates and capital expenditures fluctuate throughout the process. What we've tried to capture in the cost graph at the top of the slide is a representation of how expenditures change with each part of the permitting process. Let's begin with the pre-permitting activities. The pre-permitting activities include communication with regulators and developing a schedule for deliverable submittals to regulators with the goal of easing and accelerating regulatory review. A feasibility study and data gap analysis, as well as team development, will be necessary to determine if a Class 6 injection well project is viable. As Richard previously described, an important component of pre-permitting may also be to do to conduct an environmental justice screening. This is to assess if the anticipated area of review or AOR could include or be near disadvantaged communities, though it is notable that this is not currently a requirement. Next slide. The second step in class six permitting process, process begins with site characterization, which provides the basis for demonstrating the site suitability and for implementing site specific conditions of the project plans. This step includes the use of 2D and 3D seismic data, which are used to identify the geometry of storage zones, confining zones, and structural faults that could act as escape pathways. It also identifies stratigraphic trapping features and is used to characterize the extents and thicknesses of the storage zones and confining units. Physical conditions assessed in the site characterization will be used as the basis for the numerical modeling conducted for the evaluation of the AOR. The AOR is the delineated area for a proposed well and includes the region surrounding the proposed well where underground sources of drinking water, or USDWs, may be endangered by the injection activity. The rules require that the AOR be delineated using computational modeling, and the AOR must be reevaluated periodically during the life of the project. Within the AOR, all potential conduits for fluid movement out of the injection zone, including both geologic features and artificial penetrations like old oil wells, must be identified. Any artificial penetrations must be evaluated for the quality of casing and cementing, and in the case of abandoned wells, for the quality of plugging and abandonment. And corrective action must be performed on any identified artificial penetrations that could serve as a conduit for fluid movement. Corrective action plan is tied with the AOR and documents the owner or operator's compliance with the AOR delineation requirements, including the AOR delineation modeling approach. It also presents a comprehensive strategy for AOR reevaluations over the duration of the project and describes how any necessary corrective action will be conducted. Financial responsibility demos. Uh, the financial responsibility for corrective action, injection well plugging, post-injection site care and site closure, and emergency and remedial response must be demonstrated. The financial instruments could include trust funds, letters of credit, surety bonds, financial tests, corporate guarantees, insurance, and escrow accounts. Well construction details. The design of the well will 
be suited for the planned injection rates and site condition. This section of the permit includes well bore schematics. Pre-op te testing. This includes proposed pre-operational formation and well testing program that describes analyses of the chemical and physical characteristics of the injection and confining zones and details how wells will be tested. The purpose of the pre-op testing program is to confirm that all tests are designed to collect relevant information needed to verify that the well is properly constructed, to gather information on subsurface formations and fluid geochemistry, and to address identified uncertainties. Additionally, the program should also confirm that the proposed testing will provide information to support op operating conditions, inputs for modeling to delineate the final AOR, and to establish a baseline for parameters that will be measured during the injection and post-injection phases. Proposed pre-operational testing. The proposed pre-operational -op testing plan confirms that all tests required by regulators are planned and designed to collect the information needed to verify proper well construction, to gather information on subsurface formations and fluid geochemistry, and will address unidentified certain identified uncertainties. Proposed operating conditions. The purpose for describing proposed injection pressures, annulus pressures, and plowed downhole shutoff systems is to ensure that injection rates and volumes are appropriate to the site geology, considering any uncertainties identified in the course of site characterization and the well's construction. Testing and monitoring plan is a requirement to develop and implement a comprehensive testing and monitoring plan for the project that includes injectate monitoring, corrosion monitoring of the well's tubular, mechanical, and cement components, mechanical integrity testing, pressure falloff testing, groundwater quality monitoring, carbon dioxide plume and pressure front tracking, and potentially surface air and or soil gas monitoring. Injection well plugging plan. This plan ensures that the proposed materials and procedures for injection well plugging are appropriate to the well's approved construction and the site's geology and geochemistry. This evaluation is important in that it also ensures the injection well will not serve as a conduit for fluid movement that could endanger USDWs following cessation of injection. The post-injection site care and closure plan, or PISC, also referred to as the PISC, this plan describes the proposed post-injection monitoring activities used to ensure protection of the USDW. Emergency and remedial response plan describes actions to be taken to address events that could cause endangerment to the USDW during the construction, operation, and post-injection phases of the project. Injection depth waivers. Applicants seeking to inject above the lowermost USDW must submit a request for an injection depth waiver. This waiver provisions flexibility to allow injection into a non-USDW formation while ensuring that USDWs above and below the injection zone are protected from endangerment where the lowermost USDW is very deep. An aquifer exemption. Class two well owners or operators injecting into an exempted aquifer who have made a decision to transition from a class two to a class six and anticipate that the carbon dioxide plume and pressure front will expand beyond the area covered by an existing class two aquifer exemption will need to apply to expand their aerial extent of the aquifer exemption. The aquifer exemption affords applicants an opportunity to assess and select a suitable site in areas where oil and gas recovery has occurred while also protecting USDWs. Next slide, please. The class six permit approval process. Once uploaded to the Geologic Sequestration Data Tools or GSDT, the EPA will conduct a review of the application and will determine administrative completeness within 30 days. If, it, if administratively incomplete, a notice of deficiency or NOD will be sent to the permittee for corrections or revisions. Corrections will be made and resubmitted to the GSDT for additional review. This process may result in additional deficiencies requiring, requiring mods. Once found administratively complete, the application will then move on to the technical review. 
This process is carried out similarly to the administrative review with an exception to the 30 days associated with the admin review. Unlike the admin review process, there is no timeline associated with the technical review. After the permit is deemed both administratively and technically complete, a permit to construct is issued. So now you're ready to begin construction, but wait, there's more. Before any construction begins, additional permitting needs to be considered. Next slide. The other permitting co considerations prior to construction. Um, it is important to point out that these permits may be acquired in parallel with class six permitting, which is why the cost curve might seem higher than expected. Past practices have shown that the sooner you begin the process of acquiring the additional permits, the better. However, timing of securing additional permits can be tricky. Too early and time or money can be wasted getting a permit for a location that's deemed unsuitable. Too late and time is lost securing permits to allow for construction to begin. Some of the additional permits or reviews that may be necessary, depending on the location of the injection site, include building permits regulated by the city or county, NEPA or National Environmental Policy Act. This review is required when federal funding is used for a project. Depending on the level of review, a categorical exclusion known as a CADEX, an environmental assessment, an EA, a finding of no significant impact, FONSI, or an environmental impact statement, EIS, may be necessary. These, these po uh, processes may take more than a year to complete. It might be a consideration to begin your NEPA and CEQA permitting as soon as a project is determined to be viable, rather than waiting to begin after the class six application is submitted, given the length of time it may take for review. However, consider the risks involved by beginning the NEPA consultation early in the permitting process, as well as waiting until the permit has been submitted. A risk assessment should be evaluated for your specific project. The Endangered Species Act consultation, or ESA, must be conducted at federal and state levels, beginning with an informal consultation, review, and determination. If a biological assessment determines that an adverse effect is likely, a formal consultation and biological opinion will be prepared. These re reviews may also take more than a year to complete. State EPA may require a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, permit to be issued for any potential point source discharge into a water of the United States. Army Corps of Engineers Section 404 of the Clean Water Act permit will be necessary for any activities in the U.S. waters that include fill for development, water resource projects, infrastructure development, and or mining projects. This would include stream alteration, river transport, dredging, docking, and loading activities, among others. Maritime, maritime transport permits may be required if CO2 is transported via barge. State Department of Transportation for over-the-road transport permits may be required if CO2 is trucked. And historic cultural preservation, reserv, historic cultural preservation reviews uh, may also be necessary to evaluate the impact of all federally funded or permitted projects on historic properties which can include prehistoric or historic districts, sites, buildings, structures, objects, artifacts, records, remains, or properties of traditional religious and cultural importance to an Indian tribe or Native Hawaiian organization that are in or eligible for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places. This is all through a process known as a Section 106 review. Next slide, please. The post-injection responsibilities. The post-injection site care, or PISC, must in continue for a time frame established in the permit, which could be 50 years, unless an alternative approved time frame is established based on sp site-specific data, modeling, and other required lines of evidence demonstrating non-endangerment. During the PISC, an owner or operator may be able to demonstrate non-endangerment of the U.S. drink. USDWs prior to the 50 year period. Under these circumstances, the owner or operator may submit supporting evidence of non-endangerment to the UIC program director to support site closure 
at which time the UIC program director may subsequently authorize early site closure with substantial evidence that geologic sequestration project no longer poses a risk of endangerment to the USDW. Thanks for your attention and your time, and I will now turn it over to Casey Garber and Candy Elliott. Thank you, Patty. Again, my name is Casey Garber. In this section, Candy Elliott and I are going to zoom in a little bit more and discuss some of the various components of a carbon capture and storage project in some more detail. This flowchart shows a generalized sequence of these components where we begin with a feasibility study and then move on to the permit applications, which as Patty noted, will include the class six application and any other permits that are needed prior to beginning construction. Once permits are approved, we move into the construction phase, then pre-injection, which involves testing activities and refinements to the site data and various portions of the permit application. Then the injection phase begins, which focuses on operations, testing and monitoring, and reporting. Once injection ends, we move into the post-injection site care phase with continued testing and monitoring and reporting with the process ending at site closure. Candy and I are going to discuss these individual components in more detail in these following slides. So a carbon storage project should always start with a feasibility study. Now for a little background on Illinois, the state contains a large portion of a geologic feature known as the Illinois Basin. The Illinois Basin has been well studied for many years, particularly in the context of hydrocarbon production. There are several historic and existing class one and class two injection and disposal wells that have demonstrated the utility of underground injection for permanent disposal and isolation of fluids within geologic units. Additionally, the basin has hosted the Illinois Basin Decatur Project, which is the only CCS project that has been fully implemented to date, and it has demonstrated that Illinois has remarkably suitable geology for carbon sequestration. In general, a large portion of the basin contains likely suitable geology for sequestration, which is noted by the areas highlighted in green on the map to the left. That said, general suitability does not imply underground storage will be possible everywhere in the basin. So when scoping a project, it's highly recommended to conduct a detailed feasibility study, particularly in areas with a higher degree of geologic uncertainty as shown in yellow on the map. If sequestration is not feasible in your location or there is too much geologic uncertainty shown on the map in red, you can consider looking into offsite sequestration options. Next, please. So the pre-permitting workflow consists of two overarching phases. The first phase identify, uh, focuses on identifying stakeholders, addressing community concerns, and performing an environmental justice review, as Richard uh, detailed earlier in this presentation. Next slide, please. The second phase includes an analysis of the fiscal costs and benefits. Capital outlay will include large-scale funding of the project, including permitting, capture, transport, construction, testing. Some of these costs will be fixed and others will depend on factors such as the cost and availability of the materials at the time of construction, um, the cost of maintenance and monitoring, and any potential disruptions due to weather, power outages, et cetera. The benefits of the project include carbon credits. Um, recently, uh, I heard a value of $85 per metric ton. And there are tax incentives, government funding under the infrastructure and bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Other benefits that are not monetary but are no less important to the equation include compliance with upcoming emissions regulations and community benefits such as job creation, infrastructure improvement, and greenhouse gas reduction. Next. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit more about the permit application process. So one of the largest efforts for the class six application is the site characterization portion, which is a very detailed and comprehensive geologic assessment aimed at demonstrating that your proposed sequestration site 
has the suitable geologic characteristics for sequestration. This will require taking a look at the regional scale geology with an example shown in the cross section on the right, as well as zooming in and looking in closer detail at your local scale geology. This site characterization piece generally includes the compilation of various maps, cross sections, and a detailed narrative. This assessment is absolutely essential to demonstrate the proper characteristics are present to lead to permanence of injected CO2 and the protection of underground sources of drinking water. At this stage, you'll also complete a detailed characterization of the injection zone that will be permanently storing the injected CO2 and the confining zones and structures that will prevent the CO2 from migrating. This detailed characterization will include gathering existing and typically new core data, reviewing and correlating existing well logs, and tying those logs to acquired geophysical data, such as 2D or 3D seismic data, with an example of these shown from the Illinois Basin Decatur project above. Next slide, please. Another major piece of the permit application is the area of review and corrective action plan. During the permitting process, you're required to build a computational model using site-specific data. These data that are gathered and developed for the site characterization portion of the process are used to drive the construction of this computational model. Those data are then turned into your model layers, boundary conditions, and model parameters. One of the goals of this model is to meet the requirement of delineating your area of review or AOR by modeling the maximum CO2 plume and pressure buildup or pressure front extents, as well as predicting the migration of the plume and pressure front over time. We can then use these maximum extents and predicted migration to identify all existing wells that will require corrective action. This plan also needs to outline any triggers for the reevaluation of your AOR throughout the entire life of the project. And as a final note, this model can also be used to help you optimize the placement of your injection wells, what injection rates will be most suitable, and also what geologic intervals will be most suitable for your project. Next, please. So there are some additional ancillary plans that must be compiled for the class six permit application. The completion and refinement of these plans are guided based on the site characterization data, as well as your AOR modeling and delineation. These plans include the testing and monitoring plan, emergency and remedial response plan, injection well plugging plan, post injection site care and site closure plan, operating and reporting requirements, injection well construction plan, financial responsibility demonstration, and finally, your environmental justice report. Once the permit application and all of its components are compiled, it'll be ready to submit. All applications submitted to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency must be uploaded via their Geologic Sequestration Data Tool, or GSDT. This system is not only used to upload your initial Class 6 application submittal, but also for uploading all future data submittals and your required reporting for your Class 6 project. Your project will have its own account in this system in which you can log in to complete all of your uploads. Once the application is uploaded to the GSDT, the project enters the pre-construction phase. This starts with an administrative completeness review from the US EPA, which is a review to verify that your application meets all requirements that are specified in the applicable portions of the Code of Federal Regulations. The US EPA will provide a notice of deficiency letter in which you'll need to provide a response in the form of a GSDT upload. The agency will ultimately notify you once your application is deemed administratively complete and at that point, the detailed agency review will begin, which can take anywhere from 18 months to two years or more. When that review is complete and the agency is ready to approve the application, they will issue a permit to construct and the project will enter the pre-operation phase. Injection wells must be designed and constructed according to rigorous standards. The design is tailored to the specific reservoir characteristics, such as lithology, depth of formation, permeability, pressure, and temperature. Factors, factors such as pressure, temperature, and salinity of formation fluids 
can affect the well materials. And if they're not chosen correctly, it can compromise the integrity of the well. The well design must also prevent CO2 and fluids from moving into zones outside the injection reservoir, critically into the lowermost underground source of drinking water, or USDW. The well design must enable the use of workover tools and incorporate testing and monitoring devices. It must be constructed of materials that have sufficient structural strength to withstand the life cycle of the project. Next, please. During drilling and well construction and prior to injection, a series of tests are performed. The results of these tests can help refine the computational model that Casey was discussing and will also help delineate the AOR. The testing program includes uh, deviation checks. These are to make sure that the borehole is completely vertical, which can be quite challenging um, or a well that's over 6,000 feet deep. Geophysical logs are collected, including gamma ray, spontaneous potential, resistivity, caliper logs, rock cores. These cores are critical to refining reservoir and seal parameters. Cement bond testing is performed, temperatures are monitored, and there's mechanical integrity testing. Next slide, please. So the values obtained during the pre-injection testing and monitoring include parameters such as the temperature gradient, formation permeability, and the pressure. These real-world data are used to adjust model assumptions and to make the model more accurate, or as George Box would say, more useful. Next slide, please. During injection, testing and monitoring are continuously employed to meet monitoring and reporting requirements. Reporting frequencies can range from quarterly to annually. Mechanical integrity and pressure falloff tests ensure that the well and the injection are performing properly. Vertical seismic profiling can help map the CO2 plume relative to the injection well and changes to formation material properties. Pressure front monitoring ensures that pressures in and outside the reservoir do not exceed projections. Groundwater monitoring helps identify any effects on groundwater quality. Micro seismicity monitoring identifies movement along faults and fractures. Surface and near surface monitoring measures CO2 flux. Next, please. A relatively new technology that's being implemented is Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, or INSAR, which can measure centimeter scale uplift across the area. Drones can also assist in measuring a number of properties and can reduce monitoring time and expense. And back to you, Casey. Next slide. Once injection ceases, we move into the post-injection site care period. The injection well will need to be plugged according to your injection well plugging plan if it will no longer be used. It is acceptable to convert the injection well into a monitoring well for a brief or extended period, provided that you can demonstrate the well retains mechanical integrity and USDW protection is ensured. If not being used, it will need to be plugged. During the PISC period, we conduct monitoring that provides information on the plume and the pressure front behavior to confirm that USDWs are protected and to support the final non-endangerment demonstration and subsequent site closure. This includes continued plume and pressure front tracking and geochemical monitoring and reporting. This period has a default duration of 50 years or an alternative duration as demonstrated in your PISC plan. It must continue until a non-endangerment demonstration is approved and site closure is authorized. Next, please. Once the non-endangerment demonstration is approved, we need to cease monitoring activities and submit a notice of intent to close the site. At that point, all monitoring wells should be properly plugged. Also, any other site activities needed to restore the site to its prior operating condition can be completed using decommissioning of any on-site facilities that are remaining. Once the site is closed, we submit a site closure report that details the closure process. 
A final step is to record a notation on the deed to the facility, essentially stating that the land was used for sequestration of carbon dioxide. Next, please. So now that we've discussed the details of the process behind a CCS project, let's take a look at some of the lessons learned from CCS work that's been taken, that's, excuse me, been completed to date. These lessons learned are based on a narrative that was compiled by the Illinois State Geological Survey from their experience with the Illinois Basin Decatur Project, as well as what we at SCS have learned going through the compilation and submittal of Class 6 permit applications. So the first lesson learned follows the theme of early planning. Mindful project scoping is absolutely critical for a CCS project. From the earliest stages, it's essential to be able to understand and communicate the needs, objectives, and conceptualize design of the project. It is important to understand what the natures and goals of the CCS project are and strategically tailor your permitting process to the project design with those goals in mind. Early financial planning is also important. You need to consider your stakeholders and where they come into play. Also consider that CCS projects involve long-term operations and monitoring efforts. Your spend rates will be variable throughout these projects and will be highly dependent on what phase the project is in. Finally, we discussed in detail earlier that site geology is a key factor for scoping a CCS project. We highly recommend conducting a feasibility study before beginning a project to assess the suitability of class six injection at the proposed project location. In addition, when the permit process begins, it's important to front load the site characterization efforts to minimize the uncertainty surrounding your site's suitability. Another lesson learned is that proactive engagement surrounding your project is more likely to help lead the, the project to success. It is a key to begin communicating with your project stakeholders, your applicable regulatory agencies, as well as the public early in the process and to keep the communication ongoing throughout the process. We recommend developing outreach plans to help open and facilitate those lines of communication with stakeholders, as well as public and environmental advocate groups. It's important to remember that the people want to learn about your CCS project from you, not in an announcement from the regulatory agency. Next, please. A final lesson learned is that an iterative project approach should be used. A class six permitting project is not a cookie cutter design. Every project will be unique and it needs to be designed on a site specific basis. Again, we stress that it's important to be robust at the front end of the project when gathering site characterization data and to have a good handle on what the operational parameters will be in order to develop a good first order model and initial area of review delineation. Your monitoring system design should then be tailored based on these data. Finally, the baseline and operational monitoring data are used to calibrate the model and refine the area of review delineation. This is essentially a feedback loop that will go on throughout the life of the project. And this approach is discussed at a high level in US EPA's Class 6 permitting guidance documents, and it does allow for flexibility in how the approach is implemented. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and attention, and I will turn it back over to Stephanie Hill for a few closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate that presentation, especially to our entire group. So that wraps up our Illinois Basin webinar on carbon capture and storage. On behalf of the speakers here today and the entire SCS carbon sequestration and injection well team, I wanna thank you for choosing to listen to this presentation. If you'd like to learn more about how your business can participate in this fast growing market, I urge you to scan the QR code on the screen. Here you'll find a number of free publications for you to download. Alternatively, you can contact any one of our speakers at the email addresses listed below their photo on this slide um, for a one-on-one -on -one CCS conversation focused on your industry. Thank you so much.